Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my talk about the self-adjusting boron nitride mask for reactive iron etching. My name is Konrad Schwanitz and I would like to talk about this ceramic shadow mask, which is shown here in its three-dimensional structure, which is perfectly aligning to the assembly underneath. But I would like to talk about this in detail in the following. Let me shortly introduce the company Vika. The product ranges from pressure, temperature, level, force and flow measurement to calibration and SF6 technology and is including engineering solutions as well. We are globally present in over 44 countries and our annual production amounts approximately 50 million units worldwide. The measuring ranges from 0.5 millibars up to very high pressures to 15,000 bar and the devices some devices are temperature stable down to minus 250 celsius degrees and some are up to 1800 celsius degrees temperature sustainable here in the below um, you see some typical products of the vika portfolio like electronic pressure measurement tools shown here and here, mechanical pressure measurement tools shown here and here, level measurement and calibration technology. Let me short introduce the principle of the thin film pressure sensor and its components. Starting with the stainless steel sensor body, displayed here in gray with a typical diameter of seven millimeters, we can apply a pressure um, inside to the membrane, which bends. Due to the bending, um, the metallization um, of nickel chromium changes its resistivity and it's aligned in the whetstone bridge. And we can therefore um, extract an electrical signal due to the pressure change. Um, in between the polished sensor body surface here and the metallization structure, we need to apply uh, an electrical isolation, which is deposited via plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition. It's a silicon dioxide isolation layer with a thickness of about five microns. We apply with lithography and uh, physical um, vapor deposition processes two metallization structures like the nickel chromium resistivity elements and the nickel bond pads displayed here in red. On top of it all, we uh, deposit also with the chemical vapor deposition a silicon nitride passivation of 300 nanometer thickness. So in order to contact the sensor electrically and extract the electrical signal, uh, we need to um, etch free these uh, nickel bond pads, uh, bond pads, which are displayed here in red. Therefore, we need to apply a reactive iron etch. And in order to etch it selectively, we uh, use a ceramic shadow mask with a certain openings. The sensor geometries may differ as well. So not only seven millimeters we have, we have also uh, much bigger sensors like 12 millimeters in diameter. The reactive iron edge process is here shown in principle. So here is a tool and on the left hand side of the tool, we have this reactive iron edge chamber or module. And as a core element of this module, we have the um, inductively coupled um, reactor where we have um, driven with the radio frequency coils outside which can uh, a gas which is let in from the top the the etching gas like co4 and argon which excited so we we ionize the gas and uh, in the following we can accelerate the ions towards the shadow mask and the sensor surface by another radio frequency, which we apply to the electrode. The etching process is really simple. So starting from a fully passivated sensor surface here, shown here, we apply the hard shell shadow mask, this ceramic mask with 
certain openings in order to edge free selectively the bond pads. In the following we uh, accelerate the ions towards the surface and edge free the, the desired area and after that we can uh, remove the mask and then we have the sensor which we can um, bond via uh, wire bonding and we can uh, electrically contact it. So the big advantage of this process is the mask, this ceramic mask is reusable and self-adjusting due to, the, to its um, three-dimensional structure which perfectly aligns to the sensor body here. So there's no adjustment necessary. In order to find the perfect solution for the mask, we tried out different materials like aluminum oxide and up to now we are using boron nitride. And I would like to explain the difference of both materials. In case of the aluminum oxide, we have some, um, yeah, after a certain usage of about 50 times, um, we have some deposition, unwanted, undesired deposition on top of the mask which you can see here as black spots. The black, uh, this pattern is originating actually from the adapter, which is placed underneath the mask. And we have different plasma conditions here. And that means that we have a deposition of um, silicon, oxide, and fluoron in the stark regions. Whereas in the white regions, we have more or less a pristine aluminum oxide. In the case of the boron nitride mask, we don't have any of these uh, optical appearances. So this mask stays the same. It's rather unimpressed by this process. Um, also, I would like to show in the following how it's um, behavior of the both masks um, with respect to the sensor surface. Here we have uh, the comparison of the etching results with both different masks. Here on the left hand side, again, the aluminum oxide mask. And on the right hand side, we have the boron nitride mask. The aluminum oxide mask creates some residuals here in between the bond pads and on top of the bond pads, whereas the boron nitride mask, the surface looks rather pristine with respect to optical uh, appearance. Further investigations with scanning electron microscopy um, reveals that uh, we have particles in size of 200 nanometers on top of the nickel surface as well as on top of the um, isolation, so the, the, the surface in between the nickel pads. And the EDX um, investigations, so energy dispersive um, X-ray analysis, revealed that in the case of the aluminum oxide mask usage, we produce some uh, deposition containing aluminum and fluoride. So it's um, ALF3. Uh, whereas in the uh, boron nitride mask case, we don't have any aluminum and any fluoride on the surface. Looking further in detail to this um, residual deposition, we see that in the case on our on top of the nickel surface on the bond pads, we have uh, presumably higher concentration of these residuals as it is displayed by the darker color, whereas in between the pads, it's a little bit lighter. And the EDX line scan um, verify this um, suggestion. So in between the bond pads, the nickel bond pads, we have this region here. These are element concentrations. Here you see in, in light blue the nickel concentration, in green the carbon, in red you see a fluorine, and in blue you see aluminum. So, of course, the nickel is decreasing, but as well as the nickel decreases, you see in parallel that the carbon is decreasing, fluorine is decreasing, and aluminum is decreasing in concentration. So that is explained by the fact that the silicon oxide is etched by the reactive ion etching as well. So um, the 
byproducts and uh, the, the redeposition of aluminum fluoride and byproducts uh, in this rea reactive iron edge are also carbon fluorides, they don't have the chance to settle down and to be de deposited. Whereas on the nickel, which uh, works as a hard edge stop, you um, have uh, the problem that the residuals can settle down there. That explains uh, the concentration difference. But also the boron nitride mask changes, although we haven't seen it optically, but uh, with, with um, further investigation of an optical profilometry, which looks more in detail, we see an unused mask is rather smooth, but a uh, used mask for 50 times used, cycles used, you see that it's not etched layer by layer, it's more partially etched. And you can see it also here in this values, you have a uh, big increase in the SRA and SRRQ values, as you can see here, from new to used. Um, in the following, I would like to explain why it is the case. So we did further investigations um, on the boron nitride surface. So here on the rough, on the on the left hand side, we have a rough surface, which you can see even in this simple photograph. Um, and here on the right hand side, we have a smooth surface, which is due to a coverage. So we covered this region and this one is exposed to the plasma. Backscattered electron um, picture reveals that on the right hand side, we have more dark spots, which indicates lighter elements. And on the left hand side, we have a lighter region. So this uh, indicates heavier elements. And this is also um, verified by the elemental mapping. Um, as you can see in case of the boron, um, it's more pronounced or more abundant on the, on the right-hand side as well as nitrogen. And for the heavier elements like silicon oxide, it's uh, the opposite. So they are more on the left-hand side. Um, I need to mention that the boron nitride mask um, contains also to one third um, approximately a silicon oxide as a binder and stabilizer. So we should suggest that different uh, edge rates, uh, which are much higher for boron nitride compared to silicon oxide, produces uh, the results that um, the used surface contains more the, the staying silicon oxide from the mask and the smooth side uh, contains more the boron nitride. The interpretation of the results is shown in simple equations. So the formation of fluorine radicals uh, usually in this usual process while etching the passivation is shown here. So we ignite the plasma, we form the fluorine, fluorine radicals, the fluorine radicals, they etch away the silicon nitride and we have gas products shown here. The reaction with the aluminum oxide and boron nitride mask differs uh, differ a lot. So in the case of the aluminum oxide mask, we produce a solid residual. So aluminum fluoride is solid, whereas the boron nitride gas produces only uh, BF3, which is a gas, and uh, this component silicon oxide produces also in combination with the fluorine radicals a gas, oxide and SIF4. So the key element for a residual free surface are gaseous reaction products. I would like to thank you for your attention.